Hello everyone. I'll be sending this video, this worship out a little bit early. As many of you know, Tim has been in the hospital. He's going to be there for a while and I do appreciate all the prayers and so does he. So we decided to do a little, little bit of a shortened video uh, today and our call to worship today will be read by our son TJ. Thus says the Lord, I am the Lord, there is no other, apart from me there is no God. I will strengthen you, though you have not acknowledged me, so that from the rising of the sun to the place of its setting people may know there is none besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. I form the light and create darkness. I bring prosperity and create disaster. I, the Lord, do all these things. And now the invocation. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Let the heavens rejoice, let the earth be glad. Let the sea resound, and all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant, and everything in them. Let all the trees in the forest sing for joy. Let all creation rejoice before the Lord. The Lord reigns. Our opening hymn is Rejoice, the Lord is King. I believe uh, you have the, I'm sorry, I've got to find it here. Something else came up. Um, I believe you have the words, not the music, but the words in your bulletin. So we'll see if we can bring that up for you. Now let's take that moment that we we need every week 
that time of silent prayer. And now, turning in your bulletins to the prayer of confession, we'll read together. Gracious God, when we are asked to pay allegiance to our state, our loyalty in the final analysis is our loyalty to a government, to those who govern, men, to, to those who govern or to God. When a social equality decision threatens to impact our wallet, do we hesitate? Some things we understand to be legal obligations, but some things require our steadfast acknowledgement of the one who made us and loves us and calls us to give the final tribute to the Lord our King. Lord, help us to remember your eternal reign. Amen. God knows our every weakness and loves us still. God's mercy is from everlasting to everlasting. Through Jesus, we are free to love one another, to forgive one another, and to be forgiven. We are given new life. With full and free hearts, let us answer God's gift with our praise, devotion, and service. Thanks be to God. Our gospel reading today is from Matthew, uh, chapter 22 and verses 15 to 22. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap him in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians saying, teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth and show deference to no one. For you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, Whose head is this and whose title? They answered, The emperor's. Then he said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. The Gospel of the Lord. Every time the Pharisees try to entrap Jesus, he foils them. He sees right through them. Their question here wasn't just about paying taxes. The denarius coin was used for the census tax, which wasn't a huge amount, but this coin was considered a tribute coin because it honored the Roman Emperor Tiberius. One side had the head of Tiberius and the other a seated figure representing peace. The inscriptions on the coin reveal the Roman belief in the divinity of their emperors. It said, Caesar Augustus Tiberius, son of the divine Augustus, highest priest. Roman citizens were to regard their leader as a god and perform specific rituals to honor him. If Jesus answered the Pharisees agreeing to the lawfulness of the tax, he would be seen as accepting of the Roman occupation and the emperor's supreme authority. If Jesus denied the legitimacy of the tax, he could be charged with making a revolutionary statement against the Roman rule. I imagine the Pharisees held their breath waiting for Jesus to answer. I imagine Jesus turned that coin over in his hand and maybe he held it up to the light. Maybe he paused before asking, whose head is on this and whose title? When the Pharisees replied, it's the emperor's, maybe Jesus read the inscriptions aloud, staring back at the Pharisees. Jesus' answer was not what they were expecting. Give, therefore, to the emperor 
the things that are the emperor's, and to God, the things that are God's. Jesus provided an answer that concedes that paying a simple tax might be legal, but the rest of it, the divinity and honor that a Roman emperor was demanding, that piece was not obligatory. To treat the emperor as a god was committing idolatry on a grand scale. As always, Jesus opens eyes and gives choices. He is, in effect, asking each listener to decide where and to whom allegiance is to be given. When I was about eight years old, my grandparents came for a visit. We had no spare bedroom, so I slept on the couch and my grandparents took my room. Just before they left to return home, my grandfather handed me a silver dollar. This, he said, is your payment for the use of your room. I'd never seen a silver dollar. It had Lady Liberty on one side and an eagle on the other. I couldn't imagine spending it at our town drugstore, so I put it in my dresser drawer. Now, I've gone through quite a few dressers since then, but I still have the dollar. I never spent it because it reminds me of my grandfather and because through the years I came to know him as a man who didn't spend money foolishly. He was a banker who lived modestly and wisely. That silver dollar was the start of my money education. Until then, I never really paid much attention to money. I remember saving pennies because you could get candy or gum or a comic book with pennies. But that silver dollar seemed different and special, and I really didn't feel that I had earned it just by sleeping on a couch. My parents sometimes gave me spending money, but I had never earned any. Soon, though, I started babysitting. I made 50 cents an hour. When Christmas came, it was the first time I could buy my family gifts with my own earned money. It was an amazing feeling. As wonderful as it was, it would take many years for me to see that Christmas comes with much greater lessons about money and gift giving. The great gifts of Christmas can't be bought. The gift of the birth of Jesus, the symbolic gifts of the Magi, the gift of the Holy Spirit and promised gift of eternity, all priceless gifts, unearned but gifted by grace. My money education is an ongoing thing but I'm hopeful that my understanding of life's priorities and my obligations and my obedience to God are all clearer than in my youth. You'd think that as Christians, we would have a head start on understanding which things in life have lasting value, and you'd think that we should be able to readily know how to invest wisely. Actually, true Christian investments don't really involve money at all, or at least only in a secondary way. Jesus continues to help us with investing. Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's and to God the things that are God's. I know we learned this as render to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God. I told you that my grandfather was a wise banker. Before his death, he provided an investment for my brother and for me. There was money for my tuition at seminary. But in my final semester, I had to double up courses and I needed cash quickly. Grandfather's silver dollar in my dresser drawer wouldn't help with that. But in my jewelry box, there was an antique gold piece, a $10 coin. Grandfather had given it to my mother and upon her death, it had come to me. I held it in my hand and I remembered my mother wearing it in a necklace. How should I render it? Scripture has a way of teaching us when we least expect it. And Jesus is always available to guide us. He had said, Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store for yourselves treasures in heaven. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I cashed in that gold piece, paid my tuition, and graduated. I consider that coin a gift from my grandfather and my mother, unearned, but greatly valued because it reminded me of their love, a treasure more than gold. 
Not all decisions come with a ready scripture. Not all decisions can be made by gazing at a coin. In the United States today, the almighty dollar has become an ugly symbol. Our country has a huge national debt. There is a widening gap between the haves and the have-nots. Many have lost their jobs overnight. Many are about to be evicted. Many struggle to feed themselves and their families. Many have been shut out of opportunities. Our health care system is costly, especially for those with acute or chronic conditions. And over all this looms a pandemic in which 215,000 have died and more are infected daily. In the coming months, we will be taxed, taxed financially, physically, and spiritually. But we have a say, and we do have choices. We have elections coming up at every level, and we've heard every kind of rhetoric and every kind of speech. Now it's time to step back and return to scripture. It's a time to consider which officials represent the pathway of inclusion, humility, hospitality, and caring that Jesus has asked us to follow. Some of our choices will be difficult, but this isn't a time for a coin toss. We have to decide. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And the money in that verse means worldly goods, things that we cling to instead of clinging to God. Most decisions in life come down to a choice of loyalty. Are we loyal to scripture, loyal to Jesus' teachings, loyal to God? The Roman emperors set themselves up as divine gods to be worshiped blindly. Jesus has opened our eyes and shined a light of truth for us. In the future, we may be asked to make sacrifices. Jesus, who sacrificed his very life, understands this. We may have to be content with way less of the almighty dollar that we have stored up. But in God, there is almighty goodness, and with God, there is steadfast love. And God has stored up a perfect peace and a resting place for us, a place that is both now and forever. Amen. Instead of a hymn, we'll just play an interlude of O Worship the King. It will help us reflect a little bit on some of the choices that we have to make. See if I can find it here. I'll worship the king as an interlude.
And now I just ask that you take a minute and look at your bulletin and remember those who are in need of our prayers. And if there are things that are on your heart, it's the time to lift them up to the Lord. And so we'll make this prayer together. O oh Lord, hear the prayers of your faithful servants. We pray for healing. We pray for strength. We pray for guidance as we make the prayer you gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. So, as with every week, uh, we will have our benediction and our closing hymn. Our closing hymn is, O for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. May the Lord watch between me and thee while we are absent one from another.